in the name of our wondrous God. Amen. Amen. Imagine being a pen pal of Pope Francis. It must be incredibly special. For apparently there is a young boy or young man whose name is Nicholas Marasco, who is a pen pal of the Pope's. Nicholas suffers from a terrible brain disease called encephalop let me try that again, encephalopathy. I can't say it properly, but you know the one I mean. And part of the way it manifests itself in his life, because different people have different symptoms, is that as yet, certainly at the time of writing the letter, he was unable to speak and unable to walk. Nicholas' parents help him to write his letters to the Pope in their regular correspondence. This is Nicholas's first letter to the Pope. Dear Francis, my name is Nicholas and I am 16. Since I am unable to write to you because I still cannot speak or walk, I ask my parents to do it for me because they know me best. Every night, ever since you asked me, I pray to my guardian angel, whose name is Eusebio, and who is very patient, to watch over you and help you. You can be sure he's good at it because he watches over me and he's with me every day. I would very much like to go and see you and receive your blessing and a kiss, just that. I send you many greetings and I continue praying to Eusebio to watch over you and give you strength. Love, Nicholas. Pope Francis was understandably deeply moved by Nicholas's letter and he very quickly responded, Dear Nicholas, thank you so much for your letter. Thank you so much for praying for me. Your prayers are helping me to do my work, which is to bring Jesus to the people. For this reason, dear Nicholas, you are important to me. And I want to ask you a favour. Keep helping me with your prayers. And also keep praying to Eusebio, who is surely friends with my guardian angel, who also watches over me. Nicholas, thanks for your help. I am praying for you. May Jesus bless you and the Holy Virgin watch over you. Affectionately and with my blessing, Francis. Pope Francis and Nicholas are obviously deeply aware of something which many of us easily forget. That they are angels watching over us, protecting us and inspiring us. Just like us, angels are unique beings distinctively created by God for specific purposes. Often in images on Christmas cards, angels are represented as plump, cuddly, rosy cupids bouncing around on pink clouds. But the real angels whom we encounter in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures are strong guardians, defenders of the faith, and awe-inspiring messengers. Angels serve at God's throne. They help to convey God's plans to us and help us in our battle with temptation and evil. And they're as active today as they were in the past. The painting for today, and my apologies, I forgot to bring it with me, but do go and Google it, is a painting by Giovanni Battista Gaoli, and he painted it in 1672. It is entitled, Concert of Angels. The angels in the foreground of the painting are depicted in stylized gestures of praising the Lord, either through singing hymns and or playing instruments. I wonder, is this painting perhaps a human visualization of a heavenly liturgy? And if it is, then there's some intriguing implications in terms of heaven and earth mirroring one another. Remember that the Our Father points to this through the phrase on, heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. So when we worship in church, when we live out the God-focused beauty and wonder of the liturgy, 
then we're also integrated into the heavenly liturgy, which is attended by thousands upon thousands of angelic choirs. Again and again, we catch glimpses, we catch revelations that heaven is not a totally alien environment, but is an intensification of the magnificence of earth. However, without any of the ugliness, deathliness, suffering and pain that often infects the earth. When we become conduits of beautiful earthly liturgy which intentionally directs our attention to the divine mystery being celebrated, when music forms a part of prayer and praise in which all participate, then a sliver of heaven inserts itself into our awareness and heaven and earth are bonded together through Jesus. What's also noteworthy about Gaoli's painting is his intentional use of design, form and colour to create a sense of harmony. This is meant to be an external expression of the inner or spiritual reality of angels. Angels in heaven totally and fully embrace God's will their actions and mission are therefore united in divine harmony. And it's through this blissful communion between God and angels that a sublime celestial music emerges. And we sometimes catch glimpses of this, often, not exclusively, but often through classical music. One of the pieces we'll be hearing during Holy Communion is for me precisely something of a glimpse into heaven. It's Morton Lauritsen's O Magnum Mysterium. When all participants in a choir or orchestra, in all their variety and multiplicity, come together as one and are raptly attentive to the conductor, the potential to move the soul is vast. Since God is our conductor, what if we all believers, in all our variety, were to offer our rapt, undivided attention and availability to God? Would this not have the potential to move the soul of the entire world? The variety which we see around us in the world is also part of heaven, and it is celebrated and valued. Medieval theologians noted all of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures passages and extra extrapolated various types of angels and their tasks. Broadly speaking, angels seem to be subdivided into three groups of three broad foci, and within these there are detailed variations. So the first of these triumvirate groupings of choirs primarily function to behold and adore God. And these are subdivided then into three specializations within that adoration of God. The first are the seraphim, and that name means the burning ones. They are closest to God, and the reason for them being called the burning ones is that they believe or we name them as such because they are closest to the flame of divine love. Their ministry is to behold and gaze and adore God. The second of this little triumvirate are the cherubim, and they mainly contemplate God's providential action. Thirdly, the thrones. They are angels who contemplate God's power and judgment. In the second triumvirate of angels, we have a focus which is primarily on carrying out or fulfilling God's providential plans. So they are the dominions who command and rule over other angels. Then there are the virtues, virtues meaning power or energy, who are mandated to manage the other angels, I beg your pardon, to manage the universe and the heavenly bodies. And the third subset in this triumvirate are the powers. And these angels have the purpose of fighting against in evil influences that try to thwart God's plans. 
the final triumvirate is more directly involved in human affairs. We have the principalities who care for cities, nations and kingdoms. The archangels who carry God's important messages to humanity, for example, Gabriel. Guardian angels who are assigned to each and every person on this planet. If angels apparently are divided into these specialized fields and purposes, and earth is a reflection, be it a, a pale one, of, of heaven, then how come human beings don't seem to be created in the same way, with specialities of purpose? I don't know, but I do trust that God knows. However, what I do know is that we as people actually minister using all of these forms of angelic ministry as represented by the nine choirs of angels. In other words, in a day, I can minister as a guardian to someone who's vulnerable. I can stand firm against temptation and evil. I spend time adoring and praising God. Spend time being aware of God's provision and so on and so forth. We humans seem to operate within all of those angelic ministries but without the supernatural power. So it is useful to know these angelic specializations because we on earth can use them as a rule of life for ourselves to measure our faithfulness in terms of how we are reflecting heaven and also to be in collaboration with heaven, with heaven on earth. We humans also have other spiritual gifts and fruits which help to enhance life on earth. So in conclusion, heaven and earth really are inextricably interwoven and when we inhabit the grace of God harmoniously, then the bonds of heaven and earth are more tangibly experienced and the relationality and complementarity of all life becomes a beautiful symphony of love. Amen. Amen.